So I think some of the lessons that um, I've learned, particularly I think when, when we're talking about youth engagement, which I think is so critically important, um, is, is don't wait your turn. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Fizzy Fizzy Project. This is a place where we engage change makers doing right by their communities, and we aim to share what they have to say. My name is Bijan, and before we get into it, I wanna wish everybody a happy new year. All the best to you and yours, a safe and happy 2021. In this episode, I had the pleasure of chatting with Justin Chinat, a former state senator from my home state of Maine, about civics education, his new nonprofit, the Maine Democracy Project, which you can check out here, by the way, his new book, The Great Whoopie Pie Debate, and how young people shouldn't feel like they have to wait their turn in order to get involved. I think it's more important now than ever to find your voice. And even as a young person, to realize that your voice matters and that the ideas that you have deserve to be shared. Get involved, get active, find organizations and causes that you care about in your community and make a change. I hope that you guys get something out of our conversation. I certainly enjoyed it. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate you coming back and I'll see you in the next one. See you. The easiest place to start is obviously thank you so much for coming on and making the time. I really appreciate it. Um, I've known about you for quite some time um, throughout my engagements in Maine and, and having grown up there and, and staying abreast of the news and, and obviously watching a number of your, your speeches on the floor and some of the work that you've done. Uh, really inspirational. I'm just really lucky and fortunate to be having you. So, um, you know, you've, you've done quite a bit, as, as we mentioned, you've done quite a bit in your time that has benefited the state of Maine. I think all of us are really appreciative uh, for that, you know, uh, youngest legislator elected to, elected, elected the Maine House, Maine Board of Education, the age of 17, my goodness, you know, <laughs> you were the state senator uh, for quite some time, you uh, are a Rotarian, you founded Soccer Bikes for Kids, you worked at the Soccer Bay Center for Civics Engagement, um, you're an author. So, you know, it's, it's, it's so clear to folks like me that, you know, you obviously have a propensity for service over self. And, you know, that's, that's quite a big line item to write into somebody's history over the last 10 years. Quite a bit of accomplishment in there, quite a bit of experience, and I'm sure quite a bit of lessons learned. So I, I'm just really curious. Uh, you, made, you made the decision to get into public life, give back to your community. And I'm just wondering if you could share, you know, some of your lessons learned as you look back and, and some of the memorable moments. Um, sometimes they can really uh, surprise you. So I'm just curious to, to, to hear your thoughts on, you know, when you look back, what are the things you're going to remember the most? Well, you were reading off that list. I'm like, I'm ready to retire. That's not retire <laughs> already. Um, but I think some of the lessons that um, I've learned, particularly, I think, when, when we're talking about youth engagement, which I think is so critically important, um, is, is don't wait your turn. Um, you know, it, I think it's so easy for youth in particular to sort of look for or wait for permission uh, to get involved or um, particularly because not because of their own volition, but because I think society for a long time, at least, uh, and at least for me, I felt that I needed to be a certain age before I could start doing something. So typically, you know, when you turn 18, that magic number, you can register to vote and, and you can, um, you know, be an informed citizen. Um, but at the same time, it's like, uh, there's no manual for life um, that sort of dictates right. sort of what, like when you turn 18, what you have to do. Um, and I think, you know, we, we have sort of a mixed bag in terms of civics education um, that we hopefully are going to fix um, that I, I don't think we're adequately necessarily preparing uh, the next generation of leaders, advocates and voters uh, properly. And so I know when I was growing up, I always felt like I was being stymied from using my voice because I couldn't vote yet. Um, and instead of being empowered or educated along that path, um, I sort of got a lot of frustration <laughs> that was sort of building inside me. Everyone kept telling me, oh, you can't vote yet, so your opinion doesn't matter. Um, instead of finding an outlet, a creative outlet for youth engagement, I sort of just felt like no one was listening. And so when I became a, uh, the first student member on the Maine State Board of Education, I sort of used that as a platform to start talking about, well, how can we involve youth in, in a way that they feel heard, 
they feel respected, they have a, and hopefully a seat at the table. And in, in that case, we, we did have a seat at the table to a certain extent, but we didn't have a right to vote as a member of the State Board of Education. So, um, you know, and, and that's a big deal because you can have your voice, but if you don't have a vote for leverage, uh, it creates some interesting dynamics. Um, and so advocating for changes on there was really important. And one of those things was focusing on civics-based education and, and trying to lift uh, youth up and, and educating them about how their own government works so that they can hopefully at some point uh, take the reins and, and provide the leadership that we're so desperately in need of. So I think my, my main takeaway was through that frustration, I channeled that into action. And I think that's really important. I think we're seeing so many youth um, you know, stand up and speak out uh, on climate change and so many important issues, social justice issues, um, you know, in, in the streets, marching in the streets. And so hopefully uh, that can then be channeled into, well, what does that mean for our government? What does that mean for our politics? Um, and where can we make sure that these youth voices um, feel heard and then do something about it? So what is the end result? And the end result hopefully is progress. And so we just wanna make sure we're constantly thinking about how can we foster that next generation of leadership in everything that we do. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And also, you know, having the, the vote <laughs> living in DC, I'm sure there'd be plenty of other people here that would also kind of have that, that a similar perspective on that. Right. Um, so, so I, I'm curious, and I and I really love you know the the, the theme that you were bringing up about um, you know feeling stymied and, and not necessarily having a channel mm -hmm. or know necessarily how how to engage. And I think um, you know <laughs> if you were look back even over ten years ago to now, you know there's organizations out there that that help uh, all sorts of young people from many different socioeconomic backgrounds, many different positions in life. You know, upbringings um, across the country, regardless of you know where where they live, understand kind of the path to, to create that change for themselves, um, and and I think that that's I think that that's a great that's a great thing right now, and I don't necessarily know if that's in its infancy. Um, I certainly don't think it's mature, but I think over the last six seven months, and certainly over the last four years, we've seen a tidal wave. Of engagement, hope from from young people finding their voice, as you, as you always say, you know, finding finding their voice, finding their position, finding their way to see themselves in their government, and I think that that is such a, such such a good thing to see, and I think there's going to be some really goodness coming out of that. Um, I know there's lots of folks across the country that are making impacts at all levels of government, um, and so you know, I, I'm just curious as you as you as you've gone to um, you know different schools and you work with different organizations across the country is there is there a perception of i guess what is the perception of uh younger people getting into local politics and um you know how achievable that is and really what that means because i think so many people think when they think about government they think about oh this is a very rigid boring non-impactful entity yeah. full of mistakes and posturing and and this sort of thing and i think and i think to, <laughs> to some degree there are elements that certainly do need improvement i don't think anybody would disagree um but that's not necessarily the reality on the ground so i yeah, i think a great way to getting into that is to take the first step into you know local politics or or a, you know a, a municipal position or something like that so i guess when you go around and you have these conversations with with younger people, kids, um, you know, middle school, high school aged uh, young people looking to learn more about civics, is the conversation kind of centered around that kind of how to get started? Yeah, and and I think that the the high line thirty thousand foot view is you don't need a title to make a difference, right? I think we we tend to lean towards you have to run for office, which I'm always I always preface every conversation with a student group or organization as you should all run for office, particularly like the young women in the crowd, because we need right. to have a government that actually looks like the population that they are representing. Um, so I always preface that, but I also say that well, don't forget about 
uh, finding your voice and, and finding your place in society in a different way and, and how to make your impact in a different way. It could be joining a nonprofit board, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of good work, a lot of good nonprofits out there that um, you know you can fulfill your service in that capacity. You know, service takes so many different forms, and through Rotary, I've really discovered that that service to me is a lifestyle um, more than it is a, a catchphrase, right? It's right. something that you live every day, um, and so even those little things really make a big difference, and so. Um, it could be organizing, you know, a fundraiser for a charitable or event or organization. Uh, it could be joining a board or commission. There are so many, and you talk about municipal government, um, and I just use in my own city, in the city of Saco, Maine, uh, we have so many openings for boards and commissions. You can basically get a mayoral appointment, and actually I just got two students uh, two college students on our local, one of our local uh, commissions in our city, um, because they had a passion for the environment, they had a passion uh, for conservation, and so I said, why not join uh, our conservation commission? What's that? What, you know, how, what do they do? And so a lot of times, it's just about connecting uh, youth to opportunities. And, and a lot of times, it, 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 you know, we can't just say, oh, we, we posted it on the city website, so everyone must automatically know about it. Right. right. We have to talk and reach people where they're at. And so that sometimes means going to the schools and talking to kids, or that sometimes means, you know, going to our colleges and universities, virtually or otherwise, and saying, hey, do you know, like, there's some opportunities you can get involved in your own um, community. And so, we just got two, two college students um, on our uh, conservation commission. And that's just one example. And, and their task is to try to conserve land for future generations. And so it's such a powerful statement where when we're talking about global climate change, how do you make an impact on an issue that's global, right? You got to think local. What can you do in your own backyard? That's how you make the impact, right? You can, because it can seem overwhelming, you know, like where do you start, right? And it's not just climate change, but with every issue that we have in this country and in around the world, it can so seem like you're either far removed or it's like, how can my one voice or vote make an impact? And then you start to break down, well, what, what you take that issue and then say, well, how does this impact my community, mm -hmm. in my town? And then, okay, well, what, what does that mean for involvement? Is there an organization or a board or a commission or something where some sort of outlet or platform that I can get involved with to help my own community, my own neck of the woods? And when you're able to make a small ripple in your local area, that has monumental impact statewide, across the country and across the world. And so uh, I think absolutely starting local is a great thing. Um, you know, I went right to the legislature right out of college, <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right path for everyone else. Um, you know, I always tell students, particularly if they're thinking about going into politics or public service, think about what you want to do for a job <laughs> to actually pay the bills. Um, because in a lot of legis legislatures, they're not full time. Right. And so you have to think about, OK, maybe school board or a city council seat is a little bit better because I can do that in the evenings um, you know, away from my day job. So think about what you want to do for like your regular job first. Right. Think about a major or college degree or a trade that gets you to that point. And then let service be an element that is secondary to your first job. And then see how that flows, see how that works. Uh, you're not going to immediately become a congressperson. Uh, and so just recognizing that and recognizing that that's not the only vehicle to make an impact. A lot of people are volunteers. A lot of people are doing things, things out of the goodness of their heart, not because they have to or because they're being paid to do it, because they want to do it. Um, and so, and I think this pandemic has illustrated not just need, but how people can really come together in times of need to help one another. And so when I see fellow folks, you know, in our, in our community, our neighbors, um, you know, helping out to, to feed people quite literally, you know, we've had, uh, you know, a dozen or so, uh, you know, instances where we've had uh, to give away thousands of boxes of free food during this pandemic. And to see folks say, you know, it doesn't matter what my day job is, I'm going to come out and help with this. 
that impact uh, is, is, is goes beyond quantifiable data that goes beyond a title or a position. And so I just think it's really important to think outside the box of what service looks like and means to you. A lot of my family members are in the armed forces. That's their chosen vehicle of service. But for you, it could look entirely different than somebody else. Don't compare your journey of service with somebody else's journey of service. And don't think that a title makes you a leader because it doesn't. What's to live by? So, so the, the underlying message is run for something. <laughs> run for something, <laughs> run for something, run for something. <laughs> As so well, actually, join something, run for something, join something. It, the key is to do something. Do something. Don't just sit behind a keyboard and say that I posted something on social media and somehow thinking that's going to move the needle. Get out and do something. And so whether it's running for something or it's joining something or it's starting something, you can really make an impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that actually, um, I think that's super important because a lot of people, even, including myself, you know, I, I, I grew up in North Deering in, in Portland, Maine, and I, I would say that my civics education, I, I, I've always been interested in government. I've always been interested in public policy. I've always been interested in the debate, right? The debate of where we go next and how we improve. And I think that that kind of blends into what, what I do now, um, working more on the advisory side and, and working with, with public institutions down here in DC and just kind of help helping inform that conversation in my own my own small way. And now that is my full-time job. So uh, it's a little bit a little bit different I think than going out there and, and you know looking for a, a position or how I can get involved in my community. So I've kind of been lucky in this way, but there's a lot of folks out there that it's just taking that first step and not necessarily knowing oh do I boil the ocean or do I you know take a cup out of it and try, and try and take that that first sip and not the ocean but maybe a bottle of Poland Spring or, or something like that. Bad analogy. Um, and so uh, you, you brought up a good point, though. Um, and something I wanted to actually ask you about was, you know, you brought up the point about global climate change and, you know, uh, all of our efforts, the sum of all of our parts um, can really make an impact on a global scale. Um, if it's anything that, like, as you mentioned, this pandemic has shown us it's how interconnected we all are, not just in our backyards, not just in New England, not just in our country, but everybody around the world. We all share, you know, common existence now. Um, the world has <laughs> become closer together over the, especially over the last 20 or so years. So, so what you do now will have a ripple effect, as you mentioned, you know, uh, could potentially have an impact on the other side of the world. Now you may think growing up in a small town in Maine, well, how can that possibly be? Um, well, you know, if you get out and travel quite a bit, you, you'll notice the conversations are oftentimes very similar in other parts of the country uh, that they are in, in your own backyard or at your kitchen table. So I think, you know, there's something to be said about that. But then also, um, you know, with regard to climate change or any of the other litany of issues that, that we kind of face that are really complex, hard, you know, no easy solution. It takes time to work at them. Um, for those students, like like you mentioned, um, that you help kind of get into these commissions locally, you know, what sort of advice do you give them in terms of uh, approaching these challenges, breaking them down into to uh, digestible pieces, so that it's not you know overwhelming the world is doom and gloom, when in fact um, you know it's kind of the art of the possible. We see a solution. There is a way to move forward. There is a way you know, to, to provide a solution and to take the next step to solve some of these challenges that impact so many people in so many different places across the country. So I guess, you know, when you're talking to them about public service and sometimes you need to make hard decisions, you know, what sort of things do you, do you guide them with? Well, I, I think you have to always start with um, just recognizing it's so easy to criticize from the outside when you're not a part of the conversations and when you don't have a seat at the table. It's right. a lot tougher than when, when you're actually at the table trying to craft solutions and you represent uh, constituencies and, and you have to grapple with budgetary restraints and, and a lot of other, sort of the, the real world type situation where it's not as simple as just doing exactly what you said uh, in, a, in a protest or a march. 
Um, and so that could be frustrating because as somebody who has been frustrated for, uh, for many years about the pace of government and, and the, the pace of progress on a lot of different fronts, it can kind of seem like, what the heck are these people doing? <laughs> are they twiddling their thumbs all day? You know, um, and so I just find it so important to get a sample of real life government up close and personal to really get an understanding, um, not to make an excuse for why something has been delayed, not to make an excuse for why somebody in a position of power is not acting, but to really make sure that you understand the steps of the process that you right. understand the complexity of those steps and then how you fit into that picture, right? Um, because I think it's just so important. And, and I'll use an example. I, uh, one of the things that I, I had, had done this past year was I was a member of the, the main um, climate council's uh, marine and coastal and marine working group. Um, and, and basically there was a bunch of working groups that were tasked with helping to come up with um, sort of recommendations, this sort of master plan for how Maine, a state of Maine, can tackle climate change issues. And while we were doing stakeholder uh, meetings up open to the public, discussing with very important experts that are much smarter than I am about <laughs> climate change issues and coastal erosion and, and all those issues that we're grappling with, uh, there were these sort of youth strike protests happening at the same time who were frustrated with why aren't we making this more of an urgent matter in an emergency and sort of there was this dynamic of we literally just set up a structure to get public engagement and feedback and to come up with a plan of action while there's folks young people marching in the streets saying why aren't you doing anything and so i use that as an example because why weren't the youth at the meetings, right? And so, it, and it's not to blame the youth, it's not to blame the politicians, but there needs to be a coming together point where there's a purpose to protest, there's a purpose to, to cause good trouble. And then we need to then channel that into actionable next steps, actionable items. And so I think, again, you can do both things, but when there's a platform for engagement, use it, take it because be part of the conversation to actually craft the solutions. So I, I think it's just really important that we, again, take our passions, which are so important. Again, we're uh, so many people are passionate about a, a variety of different issues. Take that passion and be part of the mechanism to change it, to change the system. And there's so many ways to do that. It could be testifying at a bill at your state legislature. It could be going before the city council and asking for a climate, in this case, it could be like a climate resolution at a local level, but find your way of actually being a part of this, I call it the sausage making, right? Where, where the, the, the rubber meets the road of uh, action and government. Um, and so part of that is, you know, shadowing your state lawmaker. Every year that I was in the legislature, I always brought students up to the state house to shadow me for the day. You can see the caucus process, private meetings, you name it, the whole whole kit and caboodle. Um, and I and, and anybody can do that. Just ask, and especially in Maine, you're so close to your state lawmakers. And I know you you worked for one and helped get one elected. You could just pick up the phone and call them and say, or or email them, right? Right. Just say, hey, I'd love to come up to the state house for the day taking that time to do that, you learn so much. Uh, I have so many friends that went to school for political science and, and there's nothing that can prepare you for politics and government besides going and doing it. Um, right, and so right. It's so important to experience it on some level. Same thing, visit a, a city council meeting. In this case, you can do it digitally. You can do it from your pajamas from home. Right. Just, just experience that to see the process up close and it helps you get a better understanding of the potential barriers, um, and, and, and it informs your advocacy when you understand that process. And so that's why, again, I come back to why civics education is so important. When you understand how your government works on all levels, you are then going to be armed with the necessary information to make the biggest impact possible on no matter what issue that you're passionate about. Absolutely. And it's it's interesting about and I I couldn't agree more because I you know I, I I wish that growing up I wish that I had thought about this more or had somebody introduce the idea to me more make government more relatable yeah. and I think so, so often it's not you know there's 
especially at the federal level, it's uh, huge, millions and millions of people uh, working for our for the federal government. There's agencies upon agencies, agencies within agencies, and so the entire organizational structure moves more as a as a giant cruise ship than it does a little tugboat. And so, uh, you know, and we all know how many rooms are inside. Uh, cruise ships. So it can oftentimes be a daunting task to try and even relate or understand or, you know, uh, see yourself and have some context for what everybody's saying on the Sunday shows. You know, the, the shows that, that my father would watch when I was growing up and I'd have no idea what the men in suits were talking about. Um, and the one thing I really love about um, what Maine has done, and I'm sure you've experienced this and participated in this, um, holding Senate hearings digitally. I mean, I think that's such an amazing thing in a way to flatten government and increase participation wherever you are. So you could be sitting in Fort Kent and go testify in a committee hearing uh, in Augusta. And that's just because of COVID. That, that has not happened prior to this. And so that's an example where hopefully um, you know, we can learn some lessons from, from the pandemic, um, some and, and important changes can happen as a result. And so it looks like uh, a more transparent and accessible government is going to be a result uh, of the pandemic, hopefully recognizing that not everyone can take off work and physically go to the state capitol, which in some cases, as you know, could be six hours plus away, if not more. Um, and it's just, and usually what ends up happening are the lobbyists are the ones that are, that are testifying in front of committees uh, most often because they're paid to be there um, and, and you, you are not. And, and, and the legislators are supposed to be the people's lobbyists. But um, you know, when we only get sort of one-sided viewpoints uh, or at least from folks that uh, are paid to be there, it makes it really difficult to make a decision based on what's the will of the people, right? Uh, but when you make the mechanisms of government more open, um, like having hearings where anybody can testify remotely, uh, it opens that process up. So now youth in particular is a good example. They can now use digital tools uh, for organizing and advocacy, and in this case now, uh, really be a part of the legislative process like, like never before. Right, absolutely, yeah. It, it makes it more accessible, flattens in a way creates new opportunities. And so I, you know, I, I obviously recognize that the pandemic has kind of caused a, a big shift in how we all interact with our daily lives and 2020 is anything but normal. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've tried to look for the, for the goodness and in some of the silver linings and what are the ways in which we can maybe do things better? You know, which, how can we better leverage technology so that, you know, if you're unable to take off work during the day, like many of us are, um, how can you continue to, to, to have your voice heard and amplified uh, in front of your own government? And oftentimes, especially in Maine, you know, with your, the guy that was your former baseball coach or your next door neighbor um, or, or Justin Chinette, how can, you, how can you reach across and say, hey, you know, I have, I have something to say and I'd, I'd love to be able to discuss this with, with my own government. Um, so, so that actually leads me into a little bit more about the Maine Democracy Project, which is a nonprofit that you launched recently, 2020, um, we're, we're all about the aim of, uh, you know, getting younger people involved in civics education, getting involved in their government, understanding how the process works. As we kind of discussed, you know, how complicated it certainly can be for many people, you know, of all ages to understand how the process works. So, um, you know, I think, and I think we've kind of talked about this, but I wanted to hone in on a little bit more about how how the, the specific ways in which the Maine Democracy Project is going to help empower students um, and help get them get them mobilized. You know, is it a series of going around to different um, different schools and kind of holding uh, workshops and sessions, uh, or are you working on uh, more national projects, um, that sort of thing? So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what your plan is. Absolutely. No, I, I really was looking at how do I continue my service, particularly on a youth engagement front. It's really been the theme throughout my time since I was in high school, quite frankly. Um, and so for me, I want to really continue that. And, and obviously the legislature has provided me um, a platform to really have that 
discussion in a more public way and in a way that hopefully more folks pay attention to. Um, and so to, to create this organization, um, you know, my, my aim is to really tackle different age brackets, to really break it down. Um, and so that's why, uh, as you'll see, where is it? See if I can, it's like uh, the weather map when you're trying to yeah. see the low <laughs> pressure area is moving down. I, I wrote a children's book uh, and last year we actually published a coloring book version um, to, to illustrate quite literally the legislative process through uh, whoopie pies. I mean, if no one knows what whoopie pies are, you have to Google it. It's just a required thing. Um, but in Maine, whoopie pies are a big deal. It's like sort of like a sandwich cake cookie thing. Um, <laughs> you just have to do it. You have to and try. They're delicious. It. And they're delicious, by the way. They're delicious, right? So exactly. Good. Forget cupcakes. You got to go with whoopie pie. Right. Who um, doesn't love a whoopie pie? Right. And so basically, <laughs> like the, the premise is to illustrate for particularly kids like grades one through five, basically elementary school, um, you know, what what is the legislature? What do they do? Um, and we follow the steps, the process through like what if you had an idea for a bill and maybe your idea was I want to make the state dessert the whoopie pie. Um, where do you start and, and how, how does that what does that process look like? So we basically take a class in the book with their legislator up to the state house uh, through the process and we show them the process in a fun and creative way. The governor vetoes our bill and we're all mad. And you know, we it's just kind of a fun thing where we use flavors of whoopie pie to illustrate the debate. Um, so, and that's just one creative example that we're going to continue to use um, to talk to, to young kids and students. Um, and so one of the objectives is to get this book, not just this children's book and, and the coloring book, but also lesson plans out to, to, to particularly fourth grade. And fourth grade is when a lot of students are already learning about government in their curriculum. So this is a good supplement to that that makes it a little bit more alive, like more realistic. And again, you had mentioned like talking to kids on their level. That's what we're trying to do. Again, reading in about government in a textbook can be dry. It can be disconnected, uh, particularly for young people and, and students. And so to have something that's more fun and interactive um, makes it a little bit more digestible uh, for young people. And so we want to target fourth graders. Uh, we want to try to get lesson plans and a book out to every single um, elementary fourth grade classroom in the state of Maine. That's a long term goal. Um, but but that's and, and, and hopefully speak to students too um, and, and zero in on that. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, our objective is to also have some sort of publication or book that targets sort of youth more a little bit older. So probably high school slash college uh, that aims to target that group about really sort of the experiences that I've had, particularly around uh, running for office as a young person, the challenges with that, the barriers, how to overcome them, and then tips and tricks for how to be effective um, as a young person in a government position. Uh, and so to see both the, the campaign side and the government side. So basically the organization is really set up to be a platform for engagement and conversation um, and, and really educating students uh, of all age brackets uh, about the process and how they fit into it in particular. Um, and so really the sky's the limit. I'm sort of like you, uh, I wanted to create something and kind of see where it goes. I have a student intern now who's working on some creative projects. We're gonna be bringing on hopefully a fellow very, very soon that's gonna be working on a publication in an online format that's going to delve into internship opportunities for, for youth. So there's sort of like a one-stop shop for all of the political and governmental internships within the state of Maine, both federally, yes, state, and, and on the local level. Um, and so there's things like that, but basically education and, and some, some level of sort of awareness and engagement. Um, and again, I'm really looking forward to seeing where it goes. It's something I'm just doing on the side, but I just see it an opening for and an opportunity for that level of engagement. And I think a need, I think we absolutely need to constantly thinking about how can young people have a seat at the table? Um, and having served on the State Board of Education, you know, one of the areas too is just getting young people a part of boards, um, you know, like local school boards and city councils. Some school boards in the state of Maine actually have a student rep on them, but not all of them, right? And so encouraging more student participation in that way is also an element that could be part of the conversation. Registering students to vote, particularly thinking about how do we make voter registration fun and engaging? Like right now you need a physical card, you have to go down to town hall. Hopefully 
the legislature will move forward with online uh, voter registration so that we can make it easier for high school students to register. Uh, but if not, at the very least, let's make have, make it a fun competition. You know, have some sort of competition between high schools about who can register the most seniors. Like it, we just need to make it a little bit more fun for the process. Um, and, and, and that way they feel connected. They feel like it's open to them and it's accessible to them. And then they're gonna be more likely to not only register, but also actually vote in every election and then hopefully be informed enough to then see well, how can then I take that level of engagement and, and amplify it, whether it could be joining something or running for office, but we want to at least start small and kind of build on it from there. Love it. Love it. And I, and I just, I, I, fun fact, and I was, I was doing a little bit of research and I, and I can't quite remember where I saw this uh, or where, where I read about this. And you might've actually been in Augusta during this time, but that was, was that an actual debate? Um, what the state's dessert was? Was there, there was a, a debate? There was. <laughs> this was before me, so you can't hold me accountable. Okay. But um, we, I mean, just keep in mind, we have about 2,000 bills in a given session. So just keep that in mind that this isn't the only debate. But back in 2011, the state of Maine did actually have, and we referenced this, um, that we did have a real debate over whether the state dessert should be the whoopie pie. This was a real bill that a legislator put forward. Um, now we have uh, the state everything, the state bird, the you know, uh, you name it, the state tree. The problem was Pennsylvania, I think, turned out that they really wanted the whoopie pie. Some other state wanted a whoopie pie. And so ultimately we went with, or they went with, I wasn't there, I promise. Um, <laughs> they went with uh, uh, blueberry pie as the state dessert. And obviously blueberries are an important industry within the state of Maine. So it actually makes a lot of sense. And so the legislature actually made the whoopie pie the state treat. So, um, so it's not actually the state dessert, but we use the state dessert as the example, uh, but it was actually a real live debate. But of course, as you know, uh, the media will focus on that bill and not the substantive policies that I've put in, but that's okay. We'll let that, we'll let that, we'll let that lapse. But I, I think that's really important to point out because I think every time there's like a weird bill, like let's make the state dog the golden retriever, the media will have breaking news the legislature is debating uh, whether the state dog should be the golden retriever. Meanwhile, I'm sitting over here on a corner just trying to, to pass comprehensive campaign finance reform. Like, what about those bills? Or what about the 1,999 other bills that we have? But nope, we're going to focus on that one. So then everyone thinks the legislature is just twiddling their thumbs, right? Mm -hmm. And so how the media portrays government uh, is, is also an issue that has to be addressed. And having been in the journalism field for many years, I can attest to it. Um, and so just because you see something you know, in the news doesn't necessarily mean that's an accurate reflection of what's actually happening. That's why I think it's really important to see it in action so that when you see like a, a, a news you know, clip, you can be like, oh, I've been there. I know there was a lot happening that day. It wasn't just that one. <laughs> right, 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 right. I think that's really important. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And you know, if you, if you also want to Want to cut through some of some of the some of the fluff and some of the media buzz? You can find out all of that information on Maine Democracy Project. Um, right, exactly. You look them up on Google. It'll MainDemocracyProject.org cuts right through the media buzz. If your head is spinning at the end of the day and you're really tired, you just want to know what's going on in your state, uh, state of Maine. Uh, whether you live in Kittery and all the way up in Fort Kent, you can find that information in Maine Democracy Project. So don't worry. Don't worry, there's information there and, and, and you'll find information about your government if you, if you so desire to go find it. Um, <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a good point. And then, um, you know, I, another thing I, I, I saw recently that all the proceeds uh, from, from your book are going to scholarships. Yeah, so another passion of mine is, is, is helping students uh, pay for college. I mean, obviously that's a huge, um, you know, we talk about a, another big issue and another big topic is student loan debt. Uh, and it's really crippling our generation, the next generation coming in after us um, from really having sort of the, the typical life milestones that we see, whether it be marriage or buying a house and, and how that has a ripple effect on our economy and, and our entire way of life. Um, and so one of the things I've done uh, the last five years is, is have a scholarship fund. I started a, another nonprofit organization that's committed to, to raising money and, and doling out scholarship dollars. And so um, 
all of the proceeds for the book th uh, through the Maine Democracy Project will go to the scholarship fund. So we're basically keeping everything in Maine uh, and we're also helping the next generation of leaders be able to achieve their academic goals. So it really comes full circle. Um, you know, and the book is online uh, on Amazon, but it's also, um, we actually just uh, got it in our, one of our local stores. It's called the Saco Scoop. And if you're in Saco, you have to go to the I Saco will. Scoop. It's actually a nonprofit ice cream shop that we started through Saco Main Street, which is our downtown revitalization organization. And so a nonprofit as a fundraiser runs this ice cream shop as a community space, not just for ice cream, but for a gathering space. Oh. And so it's such a cool project idea. I serve on their board, so it's just a shameless plug. But it's, <laughs> but it's one of those ideas where it's like we, we you know, through our staff and our volunteers, wanted to say, well, what can we do to fuel our down, our historic downtown? How can we fuel it through creating a space that's absolutely needed where everyone could gather, even if they don't buy a scoop of ice cream, but just a, a space in our downtown where fe people can feel at home. And so we created a nonprofit ice cream shop. Um, and so we, it's like a little store too. They have a bunch of main items and different things and people, kids can come in and play games. We wow. just put like a, a letter to Santa box where kids can drop off a letter to Santa. And, you know, it just, just a fun community space. So I just throw that out there because it's like that's another example where the community can come together through a creative means uh, right. of, of helping one another, you know. Well, absolutely. I mean, next time I'm in next time I'm in Maine, um, at least <laughs> that'll be, I think, uh, in a few weeks here. I might have to stop. Saco Scoop. Uh, what a great idea. And also, like, what a great model for other towns. You know, even, even in, uh, in I used to live in Pennsylvania. Uh, went to school in Pennsylvania, so so I won't comment on the on the whoopie pie debate. Um, uh, Trying to steal our ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Going to remain a neutral party in this one. Uh, two states I'm very familiar with, um, but you know, blueberry pie is uh, <laughs> is great as well. And so you know, I just think it's I think it's fantastic to be able to create those pathways for folks that you know um, were like me, young growing up, uh, really had to kind of pave my own way. Um, I would have been super thankful to have somebody like you um, thinking about their community, thinking about the next generation of leaders and what's the first step in really doing that and ensuring that uh, folks who not, not only go after their dreams and pursue, you know, livelihood that's really rewarding and allows them to, like, as you mentioned, hit those various milestones, but also at the same time, it's a way to give back to the community and kind of create a, a cyclical, you know, uh, cycle of of giving back and, and helping to encourage others to, to pursue their dreams. So I just, I, I just wanted to mention that. And every elected official should be doing that. Every elected official should be trying to see how they can replace themselves. And I think that's really important to, to think about it that way, that you're not there indefinitely, um, even though you know, some in Congress would like to think so. Um, you know, regardless if there's term limits or not, thinking about like it, and encouraging young people to replace you is, is really should be how our politics should be operated because they're gonna be the next generation that, that steps up. And, and in many cases, they're not waiting around 20 or 30 years, they're, they want action now. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're not careful, there's gonna be uh, more primary challenges and more, more engagement on a more of a hostile level. But I think they need to be encouraging that participation in an organic and authentic way um, and at all levels of government. And I think when, when leaders do that, they're gonna find that young people have a lot of creative ideas and creative solutions. Um, and, and, and not to necessarily dismiss them just because of an age, an arbitrary age in your head that says, oh, their opinion doesn't matter yet. You know, mm -hmm. they, they are at utmost, they value, um, you know, and they're passionate about uh, so many different issues. And so just trying to channel that into some, some constructive um, and engaging ways uh, to make an impact is, is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing that I was thinking about as, as you kind of going through that and talking about the role of <clears throat> effective leader, leadership, um, and really creating the replacement that <laughs> that you you would like to see, right? What do you want to pass on? And and not to get really into legacy, but like how are you creating the pathways for the for the handoff, really, for, for the next generation of leaders? Um, and then I, you know, I also think that something is um, something. To, there's something to be said about, and I keep going back to the Wibby Pie idea and the book um, and the process of you know. Uh, uh, an idea becoming uh, a bill and to eventually becoming a law. Cause I think, I think there's some, there's some real truth in that, that, you know, 
government doesn't work unless we participate in it. And even as you were mentioning, even, even the most obscure idea um, that maybe living within your own head can be operationalized by your government, right? I mean, not all ideas will pass and not all ideas will become a law, but there is absolutely a form to bring those ideas, you know, to, to your sitting legislatures, to, to those uh, appropriate bodies that will hear those ideas. And like I mentioned, you know, um, kind of sort of like a lesson in life, you know, you can't always get what you want. Um, you might get one third of it, but that 33% uh, is worth hanging on to. And so I think there's a lesson in there about, you know, not being afraid of uh, bringing those ideas, no matter how obscure you think they might be, the government is there and, and you know, in, in some cases, um, to, to have those discussion and, and young people should also know that there's an opportunity there for those ideas to be heard and discussed and and a simple idea, you know, something like a whoopie pie or stay dessert can become a law. And it just goes to show you that the, the more participation you have, um, starting with education, the more encouraged you are from a leadership perspective to come and participate and bring those ideas, you know, you can really be the change that you, you would like to see. And, you know, it, doesn't need to, you don't need to have a whole uh, systemic revolutionary change at the moment, although that would be nice given, <laughs> given where we are nationally, I think uh, many people would probably agree with that. Um, but it can even be a small idea that can make large impacts for, for folks uh, across your state, community, and, and your country. So I think there's a really valuable lesson in there. Yeah, and I would just say that we are the government. When I mean, when I mean by that is we collectively are the government. It's not like some some abstract thought or some some weird group somewhere. Like we are we are the we're, we're responsible for our society. We're we're responsible for what is taking place. It's not like the government and us. We are the government. I just want to really make everyone aware of that because um, it's so easy to talk about like an us them situation, and it's like they work for us not the other way around. Uh, and I think it's important to remind folks about that and, and remind elected officials of that from time to time as well, uh, not just on campaign time, but in terms of keeping up this sort of theme of like, how do we sort of create replacements for ourselves in the next generation? You have to go out on a limb and, and create opportunities for that where none exist. And that could be creating internship opportunities, shadowing uh, opportunities, both on the campaign side and the government side. I mean, every campaign I've run, I've had students run my campaign. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you don't have uh, paid staffers on, on uh, state, state legislative races. And so I've had high school students manage my campaign before. I've had middle school students work on my campaign. And, and some people might think that's crazy, but they are some of the hardest working people you will ever have. They, they get so excited about it and, and, they, and they get something out of it that's gonna be with them the rest of their lives. And that's something that um, you know, transcends even that experience. I mean, that's just such a powerful thing. It mm -hmm. puts them on their own unique journey and path to service. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I, th I think that's great. You know, I, I've been thankful for my time, just my 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 small little nugget of, of involvement and kind of helping that process. And I, I you know, I, I I wish there were more opportunities, especially when I was growing up, to be able to have that experience. So, I, you know, I, uh, on behalf of my younger self, um, <clears throat> I'm really You're thankful. Still young. You're still young. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. No. Well. You know, <laughs> relative speaking, there. relatively speaking, yeah. relatively right, 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 right. We're we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, no, and I I, th I think that that that's great. And the earlier you can get involved, the you know the better. Ultimately, yeah. you know, to provide some sort of perspective, um, insight, a little bit more of an understanding of how complex things can be, and be like, oh, okay, I I understand a little bit more about how things are are working right now, albeit not perfect, but how they work today. Um, and so Maine Democracy Project, uh, fantastic way to get involved. Look them up, mainedemocracyproject.org. Or, or mainedemocracy um, highly recommend you check them out. And I also wanted to congratulate you on a recent partnership with uh, Civics Now. I mean, this is, this is I, I saw this recently and I wanted to congratulate you. I was hoping you could share a little bit more about that. Yep, so Civics Now is um, 
the, the nation's really leading uh, sort of cross-partisan coalition uh, of organizations all across the country that are trying to lead this effort to promote civics education in our school, both at a state level, but also at a federal level. Uh, and it's a and it's a it's basically a coalition from iCivics, which is an organization that was started by uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, Supreme Court Justice. Um, and so it's just a wonderful organization and uh, sort of stumbled upon it. Um, and we sort of been talking ever since. And uh, they're like, you want to be a coalition partner? I'm like, yes, I want to be a coalition partner. <laughs> um, and so they they put me on their state policy task force. And so every month we have conversations with um, sort of our colleagues across the country that are trying to do the exact same thing, trying to set up their own coalitions within the state to try to bring various stakeholders together around, whether it's Department of Education, Secretary of State's office, other organizations to see how can we improve our civic learning opportunities, or whether it be in the curriculum or sort of creative means of doing that. So uh, it's just such a great way of just connecting um, with folks and, and they're they're trying to promote um, some federal policies. I think they just have been um, successful in introducing uh, a huge civics education uh, reform package in, the, in, in Congress. And so um, just to be a part of that, to be a national coalition partner is a pretty exciting thing for our sort of new, new budding organization. Um, but uh, the key is that you know, there's lots of opportunities out there for a lot of people to engage on this topic as if, if this is of interest. So I would encourage folks that if they're interested to look up Civics Now and iCivics, uh, who are really leading the effort um, on trying to promote it. In a, and again, fun, interactive way. We, we want it to be fun for the kids and for the students to learn about how their own government works. Absolutely. Well, no, I, I, I think that's great. I, I couldn't agree more. The process should be it should be easier to understand. It should be way more fun. It's fun to sign up to vote. It's fun to go cast cast your ballot. It's fun to have your voice heard, counted, participate in your government. Super important. Can't beat that drum enough.